Well, the book is fantastic. I read it very quickly. I had it, I just got it shipped to me uh, last week, and uh, it's so many, I guess the, there's like a through line that I wanted to connect from. It starts with you talking about um, lyrics, you know, that you say are goth lyrics, you know, come from otherness, right. discomfort, unease. And yet, later on in the book, Julianne from All God Eve says that they brought her great comfort in times of crisis. Yeah. yeah. Um, there also is a quote later that says, Gothic is a mindset that responds to crisis. Right, that's, that's uh, my friend Tracy Barhey, right? and uh, she's a, a doctor of goth. There is well, such a thing, and uh, she's a great person. Um, Julianne's right, you know, she's a good friend of mine as well, and I had a lot of chats with her about this book. Um, I think the thing that I really wanted to get across was um, a lot of people would say to me very early on in the cure, you know, they, they would look at maybe three albums like 17 Seconds, Faith and Pornography and they'd, if they didn't know us and that, they would say, well, this is very depressing music and it, and it deals with dark themes and aren't you worried that, that people will, you know, feel bad when they hear this and, and maybe they might even you know, harm themselves or anything. And I, that would make me upset because I had said, no, it's absolutely the opposite. It's the truth. The, the, the music that we do and the, the, the thoughts that we uh, put out, most people have told me that, you know, it was a, it was a comfort and it was, a, it was something that helped them because they had some acknowledgement of the way that they felt. And that's what Julianne told me. She said, you know, with Drowning Man, I think it was she used to listen to. She said, you know, the fact that she could imagine that somebody could feel that way gave her something to hold on to. And that was really it, its purpose for us as well. You know, like I often tell people that uh, the early Cure records specifically were very um, much like our own diaries. You know, what we wrote about was what we were doing and what was happening. And so I think really that that's that's the function of, of you know big A art definitely is is to help you understand your world and and um, that that's really where you get the dichotomy there between you know okay there's some sad stuff here and there's some things to understand but also there, there's a way out you know I mean even even at what I consider was my favourite album of the Cure, Pornography. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's dark, but if you think about the last lyric, you know, I have to find the cure. I have to find a way out of here. There's salvation. There's there's something hopeful at it. And so that was really its purpose all along. You know, you know I mean, my experience as a goth teenager, I guess, in New Jersey, this is in the 90s. This is, you know, long after... 10 years after, you know, pornography. Yeah. And um, I just, you know, I would, you know, get in a fight with my mom or something, and then I would run upstairs to my bedroom and like light incense and immediately put on 17 seconds. <laughs> and like that, you know, the, the beginning reflection, you're just, and it's just like, okay, yeah. everything's gonna be okay. And then you sit there and you just kind of fall into the floor or rise above and you're just like yeah. dissociating in a way with the, the lyrics and the music and everything. Mood. It, it's, it's funny you should say that because uh, when you said that, I was reminded about uh, 15 years ago. I, I, I used to play a show occasionally in LA with uh, some friends of mine who, who did a. Uh, it's, it's like the comedy of sadness, really, I think is the best way to describe it. Anyway, and uh, one day I was talking with the director and he said, So, he, oh, no, he didn't know much about me and stuff and that. He said, well, do you have a son? And I said, yeah. And he said, so, so what does he do to hate you? He can't go to his room and play music very loud because you, that wouldn't upset you, would it? And I said, no, no, not really. But it's a funny kind of thing to think about. Anyway. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and I guess I should mention that uh, Actually, can you, there's a CD sitting under there uh, that I had brought in today. I wanted to hold up. Uh, no. 
Oh well, there's a CD that I used to listen to uh, called Gothic Rock, <laughs> and the liner notes were by Nick Mercer. Okay, and uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, oh yeah, yeah. It's, gonna it's literally this is a CD that I had playing in like you know my friend's boombox, <laughs> right. and the very first song is Bauhaus Dark Entries. Yeah. And this is where the namesake for my label and my right. store comes from. Right. I kind of put that together. Too. Yeah. <laughs> but so I guess I yeah I was very you know hard on sleeve of just being like okay I'm gonna name my you know everything after yeah. this you know first song on this Gothic rock compilation. Wow. That's good. Um, but you mentioned that um, in talking about Bauhaus and you know the first you know how. Bella Lugosi's Dead was right. this kind of like epic uh, song yeah. with this, you know, Peter's very funeral delivery. Right. Um, right. You also were lit, uh, label mates for a short. Yeah, <laughs> short I mean, yeah, it was kind of strange because they started about the same time as us. And so, yeah, I know I know Kevin in my house very well. And um, he told me that, you know, we sent a copy of. Uh, Bella Lugosi to Chris Perry to the Cures manager of stroke label boss and um, he said well I really like it but, but it's too long it's too long we can't bring <laughs> and they went okay thank you you know and but then you know when we first the first record we had out the 1015 and Killian Arab we we didn't have a label it wasn't a fiction label so we talked to another label Small Wonder and they put the first uh, 10,000 copies or whatever of, uh, of, of that record out. And, and then Bauhaus talks them and they put their record out. So we were label mates for a little, little while. Yeah. So, kind of strange. It was, it was early days, you know, I mean, the, the punk thing had sort of happened. And, you know, everybody was, was either signed to a big label or kind of stopped, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, it, was, it was different. That would have been like. 78, 79, maybe. Yeah. Right, and you talk about the signaling, you're the switch from, you know, ending Three Imaginary Boys with, you know, the song Three Imaginary Boys, and it was kind of a, a yeah. shift in sound. and Yeah, and tenor, I mean, because the lyric for Three Imaginary Boys came from a dream that I had about Three Imaginary Boys in the middle of a garden in the dark uh, one night, and we had I don't know, my, my friend um, James Murphy from LCD, he tells this, he, he told me, we were talking about this, he said, you know, when you first start a band, you tend to uh, listen to people that you like, and you think, okay, well, I can write a song like that. And, and so you try to write a song like your heroes, right? And so, um, but, you can never do it exactly the same as them. So the way you get it wrong is what becomes your sound, you know? It, it's like, you know, you, that happens at every band. And uh, we had always liked sort of slightly gloomy stuff, but you know, you've got to think before punk, there was a lot of prog rock going around. So we would write these huge long epics that were like triplicate songs, you know, with like, a, a, a soft part and then a very loud part, and uh, they became more. So they, they they weren't that grandiose because we couldn't play very grandiose. So, um, but they became things that had you know lots of minor chords and stuff, and so we sort of naturally gravitated towards doing something a bit darker. And really, on Three Imaginary Boys, I mean, I know Rob's not so keen on it as now. Mainly that's because we didn't have so much for saying it. You know, you've got to imagine we were like. 18 or 19, something like that, you know, we, and basically Three Imaginary Boys was our, our live set, it's what we played for the couple of years before we got a record out, and um, so we just went in and played it, and, and we sat at the back of the studio, he, he's, he seems to remember that he was sitting at the mixing desk, and that, but I remember differently, I remember that we were sitting at the back letting, you know, Mike Hedges and Chris Perry get on with it, and what came out, was something kind of startling to us. There was this big gap in the sound because there was only three of us, so everything had to fill this big place. So the drums to me were very, very loud. And I said, well, they're very loud. I said, yeah, but they, they sound good loud like that. So we kept them. And with the songs, most of them were like 
you know, a, a little adolescent, a little more poppy. But then there's a couple, like Three Imaginary Boys and Another Day, that lean more towards where we were going, you know? And so, the album came out, we did two big tours of England, driving up and down all over the place, and then we went to Europe and we did some stuff. And then, it's like there's this saying in the music business, you know, you have your whole life to make your first album, and then six months to make number two, right? Because that's the way it goes, you know, if, you, if it becomes successful, everybody goes, okay, another album. So, we made 17 seconds, but we decided, you know, Robert played to me some of the stuff that he'd thought about it, and, you know, I had some titles, so like, things like A Forest, I thought the title, and then Robert had this riff, and we played, and it was like, okay, I can play something with that. And we made it kind of, it's funny, because I was talking about this the, the other day with somebody that, that um, when you first start making music, you don't have like pre-assigned roles that tends to happen in bands. You know, if a band becomes successful, you, people tend to think, oh, well, we can't change the formula, we have to stay the same. So, you know, like, I'm the guitarist and I only play this, and I'm the drummer and I only do this. And, and that's okay, but it can get a bit boring and it can stop you being creative. So when we went in and made 17 seconds, we, um, we said to each other, it's actually, it's why you have those instrumentals in there, because we swapped instruments. And we said, okay, let's just record, you know, you play that and I'll, I'll play the bass or something. And, and, you know, not that I could play the bass, but um, you know, we tried it out, and and it was like it was a disaster. So 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 we recorded a little bit of it, and some of those snippets are in there, but not everything. You know, there's some funny treated piano when we're doing things. Um, but we the point was we were willing to be open and experiment and just keep going, not not get in the way of what was happening, you know, because that happens a lot of time with artists, they get in the way of their own uh, creation. And so, it, you know, you hear this a lot of people say, oh, well, we did we recorded this song at first, the demo, the demo was really good, and, and uh, we liked it, and then we went back and re-recorded it, it doesn't sound the same. Well, no, because it's not the same impulse. I use the same thing when I'm writing. I, I write, and, you know, like most days if I'm writing, Maybe 200 words come out, maybe 2,000, but I don't stop. I don't go back and edit it and go, oh, no, semicolon there, and that should be right. I just write, and I come back a few weeks later and, and, and edit, edit and decide what I do. Because otherwise, a uh, good friend of mine is a, a writer from uh, the Sound, Sounds magazine, he's written some books as well, Ted Nico, and, uh, or Mike, depending on which way you pronounce it, and he said, the trouble with editing your stuff is that you, you know, you sit down and you write for a whole day and at the end of the day you've got a really good paragraph. <laughs> and, and he's right, you know, you can't stop the, the train. So with 17 cents, it's the first time that we wrote stuff without stopping the train. We just sort of, we didn't have much time in the studio, we couldn't afford it. So in fact, we slept in the studio, if I remember as well. And uh, so for, you know, I don't know, a week or two weeks at the most, we just, put down everything that we could uh, until we ran out of tape. And uh, so that was really the start of, of what I consider the sort of the true cure. Yeah, right. yeah also you have uh, in the book, there's a photo of lyrics for Drowning Man Caves, or you know, right. a lyric sheet, which right. I think- for, What is for uh, All Cats Are Great? All Cats Are Great, yeah. And I feel like a lot of people Maybe I wasn't aware that you were uh, contributing a lot to the lyrics for you know yeah. these albums. Yeah, I mean you know that's the whole thing. It, it's like no, I've just done an album with uh, a good friend of mine from the band sheets, Budgie, and um, a friend of ours, Jack Life Lee, and it's coming out next Friday. That's the way we did that. We just like okay, nobody has assigned roles. Actually, something that no. Most people won't know. I discovered doing that album that, that Budgie is not only the, my generation's best drummer, because he is, right? Um, we can all agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he, he's also a masterful harmonica player, which I never knew. You know, he could even play this really, so we recorded all kinds of things. Um, it was about going back to, you know, not back to the future, but it's going back to our, our past to get the right things out of our past. And 
not not to recreate something, a, a, a little side thing from this. Before I made that album with Budgie, I, I had met him in LA one morning because he was doing an interview with a friend of mine and uh, Mr. Haskins was there from Bauhaus and we sat and had a chat and I said to everybody, well, you know, this is really good. We were sitting having a great talk. I said, you know, rather than the three tenors, we should do something, three drummers, you know, we should do something, you know. And I was half jesting, but the half wasn't, you know, and they both took me up on it. So we did some stuff and we recorded some stuff and it was sounding good. And then we called a uh, friend of Kevin's, uh, Daddy Lona from Nine Inch Nails, and he came, we said, Daddy, come and help us produce some of this. So he did. And then, you know, there's another part of this story. All drummers are friends. That's all you have to remember. It's like free basics, right? All drummers are friends. So I called up an old drumming pal of mine, who you probably don't think um, might be, but he is, um, Tommy Lee from Botley Crew. Right? <laughs> the reason being, because years ago in the 80s, me and uh, Tommy were on the same circuit doing a, a tour around North America uh, with Madonna. Madonna was playing the town the night before us or the night after, and Motley Crew were playing the night before or the night after. So we were all staying in the same hotel at some point, and I, I would never seen Madonna. She would just you know, run past everybody up in the elevator and that, and she had all these Japanese fans standing outside. I would ask them, have she talked to you yet? And they said, oh no, we've been here two days. And, 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 uh, but Tommy, I would always find Tommy in the bar. So we'd sit and talk, you know, because uh, I used to drink back then. And we'd sit and talk, and he'd tell me about his roller coaster thing that goes upside down, playing drums, and the difficulty doing that. Anyway, so when me and Kevin and Budgie had made some, a start on this uh, music, I called him up and I said, Tommy, you have the best studio I know, this, this side of, uh, you know, this side of the Rockies. So, um, can we come out and use it? He said, yeah, sure, I'll give you the bro rate. And I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so he said, but don't bring any drums. And I said, oh, okay. He said, no, because I've got a shitload of drums. He said, I've got so many drums. And I went there and he has. So he's got this room that's about the size of this store that's full floor to ceiling full of drums. And we recorded all this stuff. <coughs> and it sounded like what you would think Guy from the Cure, guy from the band, she's guy from the house, Jim Spire, guy from Nine Inch Nails with sound. It was okay, but it was like excavation. It was not, you know, it was like polishing off the dinosaur bones. And it's like, yeah, I, we don't want to do that. At that point, fate kind of intervened and, and uh, Kevin had to go off and play with Bauhaus. So just being budget. <coughs> so we didn't really know what to do with that. And I wasn't keen about how it was sounding Budgie wasn't either, and then we were like, okay, so get the hard drive, because that's what it's all on nowadays, put that in the safe, and we'll uh, uh, leave it. And then I met, uh, I knew Jackknife, because uh, some friends of mine, I, I, I just knew him socially, I kind of knew what he did as well. And I went to this old festival in Topanga, in this old hippie festival at the top of the canyon, and John Densmore, one of the original doors, was there, and he was introducing um, Willie Nelson's Sons Band, which, you know, you can imagine country's not so much my thing, but they were great. They were like sort of punk country, it was brilliant. And anyway, so I got talking to Jack Knife and I said, okay, we've got this stuff, I played in music, and then me and Budgie went back into the studio with Jack Knife and recorded that. And the long winding path to my point is that you know, we, we didn't put things in our way. We just said, okay, let's just start again. Let's just do whatever comes naturally. And we would do like we used to do with the Cure. And we, you know, we Cure from 16 to 19, we would rehearse three days a week, three nights a week at Robert's house. Uh, we would start off drinking a cup of tea or something and sit there talking and maybe we'd play some music and then we'd go and play music. And that's what we did for this album. We did the same thing. We'd go up, Budgie stayed at my house. We drove up to Topanga every morning, have a cup of coffee. And uh, Jack and I was like this big audio, he's like you, it's this big audio file. He has a million records and more come every day. And we'd be talking 
get to know each other more because like I didn't really know Jack Hyde and I knew him a bit not much and, and then he'd say, oh, I've got a record of that and he'd pick it out and we'd listen, all kinds of things. And then we'd just go, okay, let's go and play. And his studio is great because it only has like every synth known to man in one part of the studio and then like all these drums doesn't have anything else. So it was perfect for us, you know, we just, that's how we, that's how we did it. But um, I forgot the original question. <laughs> <laughs> that happens when you get to my age, by the way. We were talking about, I guess, lyrics and yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. lyrics. So, yeah, so the whole point was back in the day, we didn't have the, the demarcations that I was telling you about. Like that happens with bands as they get more successful. They're like, oh, you only do this. So I would always corroborate with the lyrics with Robert, and you know, everybody would put something in. Everybody was, you know, doing something. But it, you know, thing, I think people's perceptions changed over time, and I just wanted not. You know, it's not a surprise to me, but I just wanted to pull people in a little bit and go, okay, you know, this this is some other things that maybe you didn't know about. Great. Right. Um, we also, before getting up here, we talked about sharing, a, we both are East Catholic, mm -hmm. and just talking about how the lyrics for those albums, well, yeah. especially Faith and Pornography, were heavily, you know, uh, a reflection of, you know, growing up Catholic and, yeah. you know, Church and stuff. Yeah, culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, right, yeah. Um, yeah, I was an altar boy, like I told you, from 7 to 14, and that's got to make a lot of inroads with you. You know, and Robert and me and Mike Benson, we went to Catholic school, so and it's very dark theatrical religion, you know, and uh, I think really, you know, about the time you get to be like 14 and start to think about stuff, you know, that's when me and the church parted company. I, 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 I'm still, I still have a belief in something outside of myself, but I'm not a religious person, uh, a spiritual person maybe, I don't know. But I have uh, some different thoughts about it, but really that's the point where we started uh, the band, really, pretty much, you know, 14, 15. That's where you start to get the, the impetus to do it. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny, I, I meet a lot of people who uh, are in arts one way or the other that come from that kind of background. And it's not necessarily Catholicism, but anything that has, uh, you know, a desperate impression upon you when you were young, you know. Yeah, it definitely, you know, I'm, I was did not agree, probably around 14, I also walked away from going to like, you know, we had to do Catholic school at night or in the summer and both and you just yeah. kind of you know I'd rather sit and listen to a care record up in my room you know? <laughs> right. Right. Well, which is be yeah. interesting because your your band has become somewhat of a religion for so many people <laughs> yeah yeah that's actually way, my you know? plan to start <laughs> <laughs> well what, I think it's the next book's about right? yeah. this is the church yeah this, I think it's already started um yeah so I was thinking about that too and reading the book how a lot of you know spirituality can be gained from music, you know, um, yeah. and your music has been, you know, so, such a big part of so many people's lives. And, uh, well, I think, you know, the thing that I really uh, appreciate about the, the whole connection of music and people is that it's, it's cooperative as opposed to coercive, you know, and I always felt, looking back at a lot of my, uh, early life that I was coerced into believing and thinking in a certain way and that didn't seem to me that it was much to do with with love it, was, it seemed more to do with control of, of men by other men you know and I didn't uh, that didn't sit well with me I couldn't you know I fell out I think I probably put it in the book I fell out with the idea of papal infallibility okay so there's this dude in Rome and whatever he says has to be true because he's infallible. And I was thinking, yeah, but he's really just a bloke like me, you know. <laughs> he's got a nicer hat, maybe, but you know, it's uh, it, it's not so. So my my faith stopped there. But the, my fourteenth year was really kind of pivotal, uh, and and I think you know it's for a lot of people of that age, that of that age because. I was too young to, you know, I went to school in a different town because there's not many Catholic schools in England, Henry VIII and all that. And so, uh, 
at 14, I didn't really have the wherewithal to you know, drive myself to see my friends. So in the summer vacation, my solace was the library. That's, that's all I had. Actually, I was up here with, with Gray a few months ago talking about that the library, but um, you know, I digress. We, um, so in England, you could get one library ticket would allow you to take out three things at a time. And I have three somehow. And um, so I'd take nine things out at a time and I would take out books and records, because you could take records out from the library. And I would just listen to everything. I didn't care what it was. I'd just go and get the next three records and the next three books and I would just listen and read, listen and read. And that's what I did my 14th summer. And that's when everything started. So, you know, I'm really very well aware that everything comes from words and music, you know, ev everything in my life has come from that. And, and it has, you know, and we were lucky. We, me and Robert Michael had a great English teacher, Mr. Ansel, who you know, gave us that knowledge and said, you know, hey, look, you can change the world with this stuff because it does change the world, you know? And um, I took him at his word. Talking about your uh, friend again, James Murphy, at the, yeah. near the end of the book, there's a really good quote saying, uh, being part of an artistic movement keeps you young. Yeah. Which I love that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like you're talking about yeah. being young in school and, you know, the, the beginnings of all of this, you were very young and then you're still, yeah. you know, out there doing this. Well, that's the, that's the other thing, you know, I have, I have some friends in LA that run the, what's ostensibly really a goth store, you know, and they seem pretty young to me, you know, because they don't go home and change out of their, you know, goth attire or whatever and become different people. They they live what they love, what they're associated with. And, and James, the thing that he told me about that was like, he said he would be traveling on a plane somewhere and he'd start talking to somebody and they go, oh, what do you do? Because they, they were a businessman or something, they didn't know what he did, and they start talking, and halfway through the conversation, he would realize that they, they, they looked older than him, but they were like 10 years younger than him, you know? And I think it's, it's true, because it's about following your, it's, you know, it's, I understand in life, it's not always possible to follow your, your dreams everywhere, but, um, I've been able to do a lot of mine, and, and, and I know that it keeps you open to things mostly, you know. There, there's different things that come in that can take that away, but mostly it keeps you uh, aware. So I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's really, we live in a time now that's not dissimilar to the time that I started in, you know, like there's, you know, the rise of authoritarianism and possibly fascism and all the rest of it, and people are banning books and taking away things, and you know, it's that point where art usually comes out to confound that and, and change it and show people, hey, you don't have to be this, you can be this, you know? And uh, so I, I, I'm looking for that now, and I'm also, uh, Hopeful. It keeps me hopeful. Yeah. I think that might be a good place to, <laughs> to stop yeah. and open the floor for yeah. questions for anyone. Okay. If anybody wants to ask me a question, keep your hands up. Okay. Um, so one you have to speak loud because I'm a little bit No worries. No worries. Um, yeah. One of the big things that happened to you and the band in like 82 to 84 was you went from being the drummer to being yeah. side stage synthesizer player. Right. And you started to incorporate a lot more drum machine patterns and yeah. sounds. And obviously there were some things happened between Simon and, and, and Robert, but yeah. you were there through that. Yeah. How did that affect you personally going from center stage drummer to side stage synthesizer player? Yeah. And did you like that? Did, was was yeah. that good for you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, without, without being super serious, I was always a show off. So I wanted to be <laughs> at the front of the stage, you know? Um, but, also, you know, you, you said it, it was just a two-piece band at that point, because at the end of the point, you know, here's the other thing, like what I said about, oh, you know, you get a year, your life to make your first album, six months to make your second. The first five years of The Cure's career, we made four albums and we were on the road pretty much all the time. 
So by the time we got to the end of pornography, we were basket cases, you know, really. Just like a fight happened. Yeah, and you know, the big fight happened in Strasbourg, whatever, and that. And uh, as far as I went off to France and worked with a couple of other bands, and for me it was like, yeah, probably that's it, you know? That was the end, the end of it. You know, at the beginning of it, I thought, when we first, when, you know, there comes a point where every band says, we're gonna go professional. You know, you don't have to have a job now, we're gonna go professional. We went professional, and I thought to myself, okay, well, it's gonna be a couple of weeks, and I'll probably be back, you know, doing a thing. That was 40 years ago, so it's, it's never changed. But um, I, I think, you know, we'd had so much time together. Like Julianne Reagan said to me, we were talking about this, she said, it's very unnatural to stick, you know, young people, you know, together, 24 hours, of, you know, traveling around, working with each other, then traveling around and being, all the time, you know, it, it's like a powder keg, and that's really what happened with the team with Simon and Robert, and it just went off, and we thought, oh, well, that's going to be it, then I got a phone call from Robert, and he said, you know, should we go in the studio, I've got some ideas, and I went, okay, yeah, I'll make sure we put some things together, but at that point, sort of the, the early 80s, there's a, a lot of the new technology was starting, and I was excited by that. And, you know, to go from drums to keyboard, it's not such a big stretch as going from drums to being a guitarist or something, because, you know, if you look at the orchestra, the, you know, there's the timpani and there's the piano at the back, they're all in the same place, you know, so it's a rhythm instrument to me. So to me, I was very interested in the extra sounds you could make, and, and incorporated that into the drums, in those three albums, like 17 Seconds and Faith and Pornography. So uh, I always saw, saw myself primarily as a musician, not a particular type of musician. You know, that's what I wanted to do. So uh, that's how it happened, really. Yeah. Well, I was happy with it. Well, I still love drums. Yes? You mentioned something interesting about how the first few albums, they were like diary entries for some of the members throughout. Is there anything specific in pornography for you that was kind of a book of diary entry? Anything specific in pornography, what? As your contribution to the album. Oh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of lyrical contributions, that's in the book. And uh, the, 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 the drum things as well, you know, for us, it, it was funny because we decided, you know, we, we, we had done some demos in the studio in Surrey somewhere, and they were sounding good. We liked it. We thought, well, who can we get to work with us? Because we, we had worked with Mike Hedges for three albums, and we liked him, but it was time to move on, do something different. And so <clears throat> I had listened to a lot of crowd rock and stuff, you know, so I had Connie Plank in my mind, and, and Robert liked him too. And so we met Connie one afternoon, in, in fiction, so, you know, so this great brooding German man, you know, head to toe in black leather, you know, and he, he came and said to us, he said, uh, I've just finished an album with Killing Joke, and we went, yeah. he said, yes, the music is like an animal. And we went, okay, is he going to chase us around the studio with a whip or something? We weren't sure what was going to happen, you know, so, um, we liked him, but then we met Phil, and we liked Phil more in a way because he was like closer to our age, and, and well, actually, he was younger than us, which blows my mind, you know. But he was younger than us, and he was he had some good good ideas, you know. So I mean, that to me was was the thing, just to make um, you know, he had some ideas about making the kits really huge, which actually came from Todd Rundgren, of all people. That's where he, he got his like recording ideas from, but then we sort of walked it a little bit, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been crazy if you worked with Connie Plank yeah. in 83, because that's, he did In the Guardian with a Eurythmics yeah. that year, so I just think of that sound and that he had uh, Robert Goro playing on that album too from right. Daft, so it was, yeah. Yeah, we like that as well. Yeah. Actually, you, you'll find that if you listen to the uh, Madame of Budget, because you'll, you'll hear a lot of that in now. So. Um, yes. Oh, no, I'll go with you. Okay, you've seen you some. Uh, next one, next one. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> Hello, hi. So, hi. I'm Nikki, and I'm a musician in the Cure State of My Life. 
Okay. Um, but I wanted to find out how, how you felt about the current state of goth music and mm -hmm. if there were maybe two or three bands that are newer that you really, really like uh, that are current now. Yeah, I can bring my son to I say, yeah. It's also <laughs> yeah. it's, it's either in the book too. Yeah, I think it's really well. Who should I say, Greg? Uh, you get it yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people my age will always come up to me in, uh, in this conspiratorial whisper and go, you know, there's no good music nowadays. Go, no, you're wrong. I, I said, because you just have forgotten where to look for it, or you don't know where to look for it. You know? and I know where to look for it because I was king. You know? so, <laughs> so that's the easiest way. I mean, I like, uh, what was that we were listening today in the car coming up? Uh, we listen to Face Fatal. Face Fatal, the, the DJ. Yeah. You can't hear it, can you? Uh, uh, so can't Face Fatal, yeah. Face Fatal, it's, uh, he's, in, he's American, but he's in Germany. He runs a label yeah. called Byte, and uh, he's a resident at Berkheim. But his music kind of can go from, you know, it's this new kind of blend of high energy that's yeah. kind of with a, a techno beat. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was good. So I, I, I try and you know, keep my ears open as much as I can. But, um, yeah, that's really, that's really my one answer. Well, so. <laughs> well, the book ends with a whole chapter yeah, of all, right, the, yes. all the new goth bands to check yeah. out. So. Yeah. And also goes over all the lyrics for pornography and yeah. his contributions to you. So. So, okay. I'll, I'll come back. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yes, that one that you got. Yeah, shout it nice and loud. Okay. Um, or you can walk up. Here. Uh, since you're talking a lot about um, uh, pornography today, I was wondering, when listening to it on headphones, it sounds like really experimental and psychedelic in a way. I was wondering, it was like almost like some like Beatles type stuff on uh -huh. there. Was that like a conscious thing to try to be more experimental with that record? Uh, I always thought of the cure as experimental. Um, I, I don't think, you know, when people would ask us at the beginning, they, they, they would, you know, hapless Dutch journalists, no offense to the Dutch, but they would always ask us, you know, what, what do you call your music? And we go, well, we probably would say something like, oh, it's cure music, yeah? That's, that's what we called it, you know? And they, they wanted to put it in thing. But I feel that we were like a psychedelic punk group, really, always, because that's the kind of stuff that we listened to, all the, the psychedelic stuff, you know, because Robert's brother, the guru had a, had a big collection of, of old psychedelic records. Yeah, we listened to all that stuff. So we listened to yeah, Trout Mask, Replica, all kinds of things to get our, our influences. But with the mixing, you're right. Like, especially like the last track, pornography, there's a whole thing if you swing it around, you know, the drums are only on one side and stuff. So we, we liked all those experiments. And when I really started listening to music, my sister, had been to Germany for a year and brought back all these, uh, it was when we, she was a teenager, brought back all the Beatles records, you know, and then she left home and she gave them all to me and a little band set. So I listened to all of those things and a white album and everything. So it was, that's, yeah, it was in our blood, you know, to come from there. Yeah, for sure, the psychedelic style parts, yeah. Um, I had two questions about um, maybe like the process. So I was wondering what was most surprising or challenging for you um, when going through this book writing process, mm -hmm. and maybe what are like any like maybe like a, a similarity and difference um, with like the, between the book uh, writing process and music creation process that you found. Okay, good. I like that question. That's a good question. Um, the first book I wrote, Cured, was terrifying. Because, you know, anybody who's ever written anything like that, you have to, you know, you, you come to this thing, like, well, I go back to the beginning. My friend, uh, Rob Steen, lives in New York, and he called me up one day, and he said, are you still, this was about 10 years ago, he said, are you still thinking of writing a book? And I went, uh, yeah. And he said, okay, well, a good friend of mine's coming to open the West Coast branch of uh, this publishing company. So, I should get you to meet him for, for lunch or something, have a talk about it. Uh, okay, you know, call my bluff. And I, I went to meet uh, Ben Schaefer, who is still my editor today, so we got on very well. And um, 
But you know, at first you sit there and you think, okay, well, 2,000 word essay, I can do that maybe. But 80 to 100,000 words, you know, Microsoft Word doesn't even go past 100,000 word count. You know, it just stops and goes back to the beginning, which I found out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's no, no many more words after 100,000. Know. Um, so, but, you know, I have some other friends who are writers, and I talked to them about it, and they said, well, you know, think of, you know, because I have all these elaborate, um, I have a writing office, because I don't write at home, because the problem with writing at home is, it's time for lunch, or, oh, I, I think I should fix that. So I, I, just have a little, I just have a little office about, it's only about a mile from my house, you know, but when I'm in there and I close the door, all I'm thinking about is writing. And um, so I went there and I had this elaborate chart on the wall that had you know, a timeline of when things happened and stuff like that. That lasted for about a month. I thought, this is nonsense. I just need to pinpoint stuff and tie it all together. And my friend who writes novels, he said, yeah, get up chapter titles, write a sentence that you think describes what you want to be in that. And then put them all on cards and shuffle them around until you find an order that you like. And that's kind of what I did for the first book. For the second book, I wasn't, you know, and the rest of it's kind of, it's not easy, but it's easier because I'm writing about things that I remember from my mind, how I, it's my story. But with Goth, the hardest thing was for the first six months, I kept thinking, well, how am I going to write? Obviously, I've got my part in this, but how am I going to write other people's parts that I don't know, that I've never met? Some people I've met, some people I haven't. Um, you know, how am I going to do that? How am I going to illustrate that? And Stephen King said in his book on writing, you know, if you're not writing, when you're in the writing frame of mind, if you're not writing, you have to be reading. Otherwise, you're just going to take your mind out of it. So I was reading a lot. And I was starting to read a lot of uh, a Californian writer, actually she wrote a lot of stuff about San Francisco in the 60s and 70s, Joan Didion. And I read a lot of her stuff. And there's one story about a dentist who was killed by his wife in San Bernardino. And I really liked the way that it was like, it's a new story, but it read like a sort of noir novel, you know? And I thought, wow, this is, this is a good template for me. So, once I had that, then the rest was easy, you know, because I just had to fill in the gaps, really, in my own mind, um, <coughs> and weave it together with, you know, because it wasn't going to be like, you know, there's a couple of other goth books out at the moment, John Robb, who I know, and I know Kathy as well, um, Kathy Unsworth. Um, John's book is very encyclopedic. Well, but I couldn't do that, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do, okay, here's the story about how this affected me, and who are the protagonists, and why they're there, and, and connect the things all together that way. And um, so I, I think once I had the, that's why I have the thing about Joan Didion at the end of the book, because, you know, that's, that saved me. That was my talisman through the whole book, right? Okay, I'm going to do it after this fashion. And then um, the other question you asked was about the writing pro. It's exactly the same, except the books are usually longer. Except they're not in this case, because I just laid down, it took four years, but you know, that was the pandemic that came in as well. But, you know, but a very similar process. And actually, as enjoyable for me, both of them, you know? So which, which, I never thought of my you know, advanced years that I, you know, it's my third act. I never thought that that would happen for me. And I, I'm so, I feel so blessed and happy that that's happened, that I'm able to find something else that I love as much, you know? Okay, yes, the tall fellow. <laughs> well, I just wanted to uh, actually have a, a comment and a question. So my okay. comment is really more just to express gratitude to you to people like Robert, uh, Budgie, and Susie. Um, and so on your chest, right? Is, uh, yeah. yeah, for quite, quite a few years. But yeah. I just wanted to express how grateful I am that, you know, I grew up about 90 miles from here in the middle of like an almond orchard with a lot of conservative ideals and values. Yeah. I grew up in the, you know, 80s, uh, in the early 80s, which is when I started listening to The Cure. 
And it was really just a lifeline. I also, you know, I'm, as an aside, I'm gay, so I couldn't have felt more marginalized. Right. And so just to have these little nuggets in my early teen years to hook on to really helped me find the courage to evolve into who I am today. And just when you were reading the um, your excerpt about Joe Strummer, I really connected with that. And so I'm yeah. so grateful that, you know, that somebody from England 40 years ago made it okay for yeah. people like us to be who we are and to have the courage wow. to you know, you. move through life. So I just wanted to express my gratitude. And then my question is, will we get to um, maybe see you and Budgie perform in oh, San yeah. Francisco? Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> in, in fact, sure. in fact, I, I, uh, I know it, thank you. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything yet, but I found out. I found out. What's, what's the thing? I found out yes. I found out yesterday. Yes. So somewhere around May, I shall be played here. So. Yeah. I mean, kind of, that's kind of terrifying because we, we, you know, we've got to figure out how to do it. But um, yeah, def definitely. Good. I mean, I'm glad that you said that because that was like a couple of years ago. Well, actually, it's four years ago now. We, we got asked to do the um, Hall of Fame business, you know, and Robert called me up and he said, you know, he knows I've lived here like over a quarter of a century, so he said, what do you think about this? And I said, well, here's the thing. You know, I've traveled all around the States the last 40 years. I can go into any small town, I can spot the five or 10 kids who, who are going to be goth, they don't even know it themselves. <laughs> I, I know, I can, you know, I can, uh, yeah, oh yeah, that one, this one. Yeah. Um, but I, I said to Robert, Ooh. I said to Robert, um, yeah, we should do this because uh, I said, it's not like, it's not, a, it's not a cheesy kind of thing to do. I said, because all those kids that liked us, I lived in small towns in the Midwest or wherever that, that they would feel validated by this and vindicated, you know, and it would be great for them. They will love it, you know, and he sort of ummed and ahed for a bit, but then it kind of saw my point and he went, all right, and did it. And then they said, well, who would you like to induct you? And I said, well, what about Trev? Because, you know, I, I see the connection with him and I loved his music as well. And he said, okay, and he said, yes, he'd do it. And when he came out on stage to induct us, the first thing he said was like, yeah, I grew up in a small town, USA, Mercer, Pennsylvania, looking out over wheat fields, and what came through the radio was my salvation, and that was the cure and stuff. And so I, I, I looked at Robert, I went, see, told you, told you that was it. And, and you know, it was, it was the truth. So I, I feel where the connection is, and I feel very grateful and, and overwhelmed to have had a part in that. You know, to me, it's it's a one wonderful thing, and I, I I'm very grateful. And thank you. I cried watching. Did everybody cry? Okay. So any more for any more? Yes. Um. So the new book is called Goth. Yes. You're having an. You know it's called Goth. It's not called. I'm just telling Gray this on the way when he. Around. It's not called goth because it's goth about goth music. It's called goth as a person. Like, you know, it, if it could be called punk or, you know, yeah. it's goth. So it's like goth the person, you know, I'm saying goth. Yeah. yeah. So the book is called Goth. You have an album coming out with another esteemed goth drummer. Right. Did the writing of the book influence your approach to the music that you recorded or vice versa? Um... Yeah, I mean, you, you, I, I can't say that uh, it doesn't, because of course it does, because they were both done at the same kind of time, the same period of time. Um, but I think in the same way with the album that I want, you know, the, the album, you'll definitely know it's us, but it doesn't sound like what you might expect either. So, which we were very pleased that we didn't do it that way. Um, and the same with the book. It's like you would expect 
but not really. You know, it's a different kind of thing. A lot of people said to me, well, it seems more scholarly. And I said, well, yes, but it's also, you know, that's because I have a good friend who got to Fahi, so, you know, she's very scholarly. But also it's about, well, it's in the, in the title. It's God as a person, as a personal item, as, as opposed to, you know, the whole of Gotham. I'm not trying to describe the whole thing. I'm just saying, here's the person. Here's how you be this person. Here's how I became this person. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the record. Me and Budgie are both, uh, we talk about it a lot. We, we had a very, very similar life in so many ways. And so we're, I'm so glad to have found his friendship again at the end of my life you know, which, you know, maybe I get 20 or 30, I don't know, but we'll see. Um, at this point in my life, because it's, it's, we have all this experience together that we can share with each other, and it's like, a, you know, me and him, it's, it's a safe place for us to be. We talk every day, you know, like, the, he lives in Berlin, but, you know, we talk every day, and uh, so it's really, in, it's informed everything, that, the record and the book have informed everything. It's a, like another step forward for us. So it's great. Oh, he's doing a book too. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can let you know that. He's, Goth part two? No, no, no. His, his, his more, well, I'll let him tell you about it. Can you tell me about it? Sure. Yeah, he's doing a book. Hopefully here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, just signed a contract a couple of weeks ago. So it's, it's coming along. It's going to be out. You have to call Banshee. <laughs> ah, no, I know, what I know what it's called, and I know what the voice puts in, is in it, and uh, it's going to be really good, really good. So, yes? Um, I sort of find it really amusing, there's a lot of you who meet British musicians that move to Southern California. Mm. Like, what's that like? I mean, you've been here for a long time. I'm yeah. <laughs> fascinated by now. What's it but, like? But yes. like, it just seems sort of like, I didn't. Now that they all moved to LA, like that's no, so no, just me. Just me. <laughs> no, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a person not of, not of extremes, but I'm black and white kind of person. Mm -hmm. It's all or nothing most of the time for me. So when uh, my life had taken a turn for the worst in the late eighties, early nineties. I thought, hmm, I've got to go somewhere else because otherwise things are just going to stay the same in a bad way. And I came here because I have friends here, but I also uh, liked it the first time I, I came here in 1980. And uh, also my, my son was here as well. So I was like, I'm not going to leave him behind, so I'm going to be here. And, you know, what I always say to people is a lot of people, you know, they come and they think, well, it's true of English people, actually. Uh, every English person that ever moves to Southern California, the first place they visit is Hollywood, because that's the only place they've heard of, right? <laughs> and, and, and so they live in Hollywood for about six months, and then they go, oh my God, no, and leave <laughs> it, right? Which is exactly what I did. And um, so, you know, but I loved Los Angeles because you know, people go to Hollywood or whatever they get, you know, discovered or destroyed or both things happen, you know, it's the same. But that was my experience. My experience was acceptance and love and uh, a safe place for me to be me. And um, so, so I loved it and I always, you know, and I've actually now, I've lived here in Southern California, well, not here, but in Southern California, more than I've lived anywhere else my whole life, which amazes me. So, you know, and I know I'm an Angelina because I did an event with... Um, What's the name of your album, so? Sorry? It's the name of your album, right? Well, yes, it's the name of the album, but because that's the whole purpose of it. But also, um, I did an event uh, at the library in LA a few years ago with Chief Marin, and, uh, and <laughs> he told me, he told me, you're an Angelina now. Then something like, okay, this is it must be. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. get to sign it yeah. now. If anybody, yeah. anybody's got one more. Okay, I just have one more. Um, yeah, one more. I'm just so excited. I grew up listening to The Cure, and I love recently listening to The Curious Creature. And oh, right, so, thank you. Yeah. Yes, the podcast. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. fell into that as yeah. well. That was fun. It's yeah. this whole other iteration of like getting to know you and this whole, you know, you know. Right. And one of the things you mentioned is how you're inspired by 
my song, I wrote by your dreams. Yes. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that. You what, know, by like, the dreams? Yeah, like songs, like I think of like Brian E. Hall or mm. the chorus, and I think of you're dreaming and you're waking up and you're inspired by a dream. And like, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot, I don't really, um, I think I think a lot of the times it's like when you remember stuff, you know, you, uh, I've got a good story to tell. A friend of mine um, is another writer and he, he, he ghost writes for some people, you know, people that don't want to write their own books or something. And uh, he heard a, a story from this guy that he was writing a book about and he thought, that's a really good story, I, we should put that in the book. And, um, but I'm going to do due diligence. I'm going to ask it was about this dream that this guy had had and all these things that happened from it. And then this event happened in his life. And he went to see the other six people that were in the story to sort of, you know, check with them. And they all said the same thing. He wasn't there. We just told him that story over the years. <laughs> and he's kind of woven it into his memory, right? So uh, my point is memories and dreams and actual things that happen tend to get all into world, especially as you get older as well. And I can't, I like that. Yeah. I like that because, you know, then, then you can, you know, then life is never quite as horrible as it really is yeah. uh, and can be better than you might have imagined, you know. So I, I think that's the easiest way to explain because there's, there's a lot of things that come out of dreams in the writing and in the music all the time. And, and, and I love my dreams mostly. I, you know, I don't go, I don't wake up and think, oh, that was horrible. I, most of the time I want to stay asleep, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and one day I probably will make all of this, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to have the book signing at the front desk. Uh, thank you so much. Oh,